This is the fourth lesson of our derivatives unit three and in this lesson we're going to take a look at trigonometry and how you can take the derivatives of trig functions and here we are on this page right here page 20 I guess and we're going to begin by actually trying to see what the derivative of sine and cos are just with the help of our graphing calculator it's just a chance to kind of review the process of getting your calculator to help you by sketching a derivative so my plan is to first get my calculator to just draw the sine graph for me just over this one period for two pi. And so go to your calculator and just try putting in sine of x into uh, y1. And then um, we're gonna get the window just right. So I want my x's to go from nothing all the way up to two pi. And maybe tick marks every pi over two might look good. And for the y's, maybe from minus 1 to 1 would be fine. Scale marks, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so there's my graph of sine. It starts at 0 and then does one full cycle. goes all the way up to 1, down through 0 to negative 1, and then back to 0 again. So I'm just going to graph that first. Get my calculator out of the way. Okay, so here's, here's what sine does. It peaks at 1, comes back down to 0 then goes to negative 1 and then back up to 2 pi. Now I'm going to ask my calculator to try to draw on the same graph the derivative of sine and then we're just going to see if we recognize it. So I'm going to go into my y equals and I'll show you what this looks like on a TI-84 as well. Uh, but I want it to do its, uh, its best attempt at drawing the derivative and so that's under the math menu this n deriv, this numerical derivative. So while I'm in y2 here I'm going to go and hit the math button I think it's number eight on my calculator. Yeah, it is. Now, I wanted to take the derivative of what I had in y1, and you can get to those under the variables menu. So I go variables. I want to go over to y variables, and I have a function. So I'm pressing number one, and it's function y1. Great. Then a comma, then an x telling it that I'm using x's, and then most importantly, another x saying, let's do this at every single x value along the way. Now, another thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go and make this graph super thick just so I can tell it apart from the sine graph. Now, if you happen to have a, a TI-84, um, unfortunately, I can't make this any smaller, so it's kind of huge here, but you'd be basically doing the same thing. Okay, I'm going to have to kind of take it in and out of your view, unfortunately. If I can get it to turn it on. Okay, one second. Okay, we'll try this again. So I'm going to put my sine of x in, and I'll change my window here in a second. But just to show you what it looks like when you do a derivative on the TI-84, um, again, under the math menu, and I still think it's number 8. We'll see here. Yep, number 8. It just looks a little bit different when you do this on the TI-84. So the first thing, you know, the derivative with respect to what? You want to put an x in there. And then here's where I'm going to put in y1. So I go variables, y variables, and it's a function. So number one and number one again. And then down here where it says, okay, figured out at what x value, that's where you have to put in another x. And then it will continually do it along the way. Now this calculator, as nice as it is being the 84, it's a little bit clunky. So I'm just going to get rid of that here at this point and just use my TI-83. Um, so there, that's gone. And now let's see what this thing looks like when we actually go and graph this. So here comes the derivative of sine. So it's taken its time numerically at every point on that graph to try to do a little numerical calculation an estimate to see what the derivative is and then it's plotting that. And I recognize that. That is a function that is pretty well known to me. That starting at 1, then going to 0, down to negative 1, and then, oops, kind of missed that there. Um, in any case, this is cosine. There we go. That's a little better. <clears throat> Through 0, and then back up to 1. That's definitely cos x. So the derivative of sine is actually cos x. That's going to be nice and easy to remember. Don't have to do any limits there. It's just going to be cos. Now we're going to try this again, but try to take the derivative of cosine. So the graph of cosine, of course, looks like this. It starts at, at 1, goes down to 0, negative 1, 0, and then back up to 1. Let's just make a change here. All you have to do is change that sine to a cosine. We'll get the graph of cosine and then the graph of its derivative. 
So here it goes. There's the graph of cosine, and then we're going to get its derivative. It'd be nice if the derivative of cosine was just sine, and it's not, but it is really close. It's actually just sine, but upside down. It's just the opposite of sine, negative sine. So this is nice. I don't have to do any, um, any limits or anything. I can see that the derivative of this graph looks like this. And it's worth pointing out that this nice little deal where the derivative of sine is cos and the derivative of cos is minus sine, that only works if you're in radians. If you're not in radians, it doesn't work. Uh, and that's why we like to work in radians in calculus. So that gets us the derivative of, of sine and of cosine. Now we have to do the derivative of tangent. And this one we're going to do by hand. Uh, so I do know from just the way tangent works being opposite over adjacent. And since sine is opposite over hypotenuse and cos is adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is the exact same thing as sine divided by cos for the same angle. So I'm really trying to do the derivative of sine x on top of cos x. That's a little trig identity. It's the exact same thing as tangent. Okay, that's a quotient. So here goes, derivative of the top. Well, I just learned that that's cosine x, right? Just from right above me here, right? So derivative of the top is cos x multiplied by the bottom left alone. And then subtract, leave the top, sine x multiplied by the derivative of the bottom. And that's going to be a minus sine. all sitting on top of the bottom squared. Okay, so all of that is sitting on top of cosine of x, all squared. Well, just tidying this up ever so slightly, I could rewrite this as, in fact, I can write it shorter as cos squared x plus sine squared x, all sitting on top of cos squared x. But here's another little trig identity. If you ever have cosine squared of an angle, oops, I missed the square on the sine, plus sine squared of the same angle, the value for that is always equal to one, exactly one. That is another little trig identity, a little trig truth from the world of trigonometry. And so that just turns into a one sitting on top of this cosine squared of x. Okay, well, let's write that a little shorter. We'll finish this off here. Looks like the derivative of tan x is actually equal to, now instead of writing cosine in the bottom like that, I could just say, hey, that's like secant. And since it's cosine squared, that'll be secant squared x. That is just a trio of um, little derivative truths that you're gonna need to memorize. The derivative of sine is cos. The derivative of cos is minus sine. And the derivative of tangent is secant squared. No way around it at this point. Simply must be memorized. You also need to be ready to deal with the reciprocal trig ratios of secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Just a little reminder of who they were. I saw this in unit one. Secant x is just a mathematician's shortcut way of writing one divided by cosine x. And cosecant x, remember you can look at the second consonant. So this has got something to do with s. This is going to be 1 over sine x. And cotangent, second consonant's a t. So cotangent x is actually 1 divided by tangent x. All of those three things have derivatives as well, which do need to be memorized. They're not especially nice, but here they are. The derivative of secant x is actually secant x multiplied by tangent x. Got to memorize it. The derivative of cosecant is actually minus cosecant x cotangent x. And the derivative of cotangent x is minus cosecant squared x. No way around it. Just got to be memorized. So there, that's the uh, kind of the raw content. Now let's actually try this out and see how it goes. Try to do some derivatives here. So the derivative of 4 sine x minus cos x. Okay, so I could write this either as a y prime or dy dx. We don't often do the dy dx. Leibniz needs a chance here to shine, so let's use that. 
Um, okay, the 4 hangs around, and then the derivative of sine would just be cos. There, just a derivative, finding the exact slope of that tangent line. The derivative of cosine would be minus sine, but there's already a negative 1 hanging around, so 2 negative, that's going to be back to a positive. This will be just plus the sine x. This next one, well, I'm going to have to think of this part here as being a product, but that's okay. Derivative here, I will go Newton with a little apostrophe. So derivative of sine would be cos. And then minus x, just a nice little linear term there, that would be minus a 1. And now here comes the product. Okay, so the derivative of the first thing would be just a 9, multiplied by the other part, left alone, and then add leave the first part 9x multiplied by the derivative of the second which would be a negative sine x no need really to simplify that I, I think it's fine just as it sits there i uh, got a couple more examples out on the on the next page let's give them a try here so c derivative here well it looks like a quotient so we'll go and exercise the quotient rule we're not going to spend a lot of time tidying it up okay so that's going to be one big ugly, ooh, that's a nasty looking fraction bar. Let's try that again. Okay, and that one again too. Sometimes it does that. All right, so here we go. Derivative of the top, that would be just a plain old three. Multiplied by the bottom, left alone. 2x minus sine x, just sitting there. And then subtract, because it's a quotient rule, Leave the top, 3x, and then the derivative of the bottom. Okay, and if I just write the derivative of the bottom like this, I'd say, oh, the derivative of 2x is a 2, and the derivative of sine would be cos, so minus cos x. You know, I almost have the idea right, but this 3x needs to multiply onto all of that. So I need to put some brackets there in order to say, hey, all of that gets hit by that 3x. And then we divide all of that by the bottom of the original fraction, squared. Don't bother trying to tidy it up. We'll probably only use it once, so it's not worth it. All right, next one. Example two. What do we got going on here? Okay, that's Leibniz's notation for a second derivative. So we got to do the second derivative first, and then we're going to go and put in this one value for evaluation. Okay, this pi over two, otherwise known as 90 degrees, right? But we're working in radians, so things are good. Our derivative of sine would be cos and cos would be sine. So let's uh, let's get started with this. The first derivative, we would have derivative. Oh, we're going to be doing a derivative of a product. Okay, so we'll think of it as two factors there. Derivative of 8x squared would be 16x times the other factor just left alone. Then moving down the road, leaving the 8x squared and then the derivative of the sine, which would be cos x. Okay, great. One derivative's done. Now let's go for the second derivative. Well, I've got some more products happening here, right? I've got things multiplied together, so I'm gonna have to go and very carefully do the product rule actually twice. Okay, derivative of 16x would be a plain old 16 multiplied by the sine x, just left alone. Then reverse, we'll leave the 16x, and derivative of sine x would be cos x. Okay, keep going. Derivative of 8x squared would be 16x, multiplied by the cos x, just left alone. And then one more term, we're going to have the 8x just left alone, or 8x squared, I should say, and the derivative of cosine would be minus sine. Okay, well, it was a negative. How about I do this? How about I go sine x, and I'll say subtract there. So you start to look ahead a little bit and go, yeah, it's going to be a minus in there when we do the derivative of that cosine. Let's just change it to subtract. Now, there are a couple of terms here that you could put together. They're actually like terms, but why bother? You're only going to use this thing once. So here's, here's Leibniz's notation for doing that evaluation. And here's the way Newton would write it. He would say, yeah, once you've got that second derivative, can you please go and put in pi over 2? Can you go and put in, you know, 90 degrees? All right, here we go. Putting in 90 degrees, pi over 2. So 16 times, all right, 
sine of pi over 2. I, I say 90 degrees because that's how I think about it. Sine of 90 degrees is a 1, you know, so sine of pi over 2 is 1. Continuing on, I'm going to have 16 times pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2, okay, cosine of 90, think about the x value of the unit circle, that's a 0. All right, that's wasting your time. And then an identical one, 16 times pi over 2 times a 0, wasting our time here. And then the last one, minus 8 times pi over 2 squared, and then the sine of pi over 2 is just a 1. Okay, um, not much left here. We've got a 16, and then what's happening here? We're going to have a pi squared on top of a 4, which bumps into the 8. That's going to be just a 2, so minus 2 pi squared. Done. Example three, whoa, this is asking us to do 11 derivatives of that function. And then after 11 derivatives, then we're going to go and put in pi over three into that 11th derivative. Um, well, the good news is we're not going to do 11. We're going to do a few of them, but we're not going to do 11. So let's just take a look here. First derivative, derivative of sine would be cos and the two hangs around. So two cos x. Second derivative, derivative of cos is a minus sine, so we're at minus 2 sine x. Notice we're almost looking at the same thing that we started with. It's close, but not quite. It's off by a minus sign, but things get better. Third derivative. Third derivative would be a minus 2 hanging around and then a cosine x. And then here comes the magic. When we get to the fourth derivative, the derivative of cos would be a minus sine. We'd now have two negatives, so we'd be back to a positive 2 and then a sine x. And now we are back exactly where we started. Right? We started off with 2 sine x. Four derivatives later, we're sitting at exactly the same thing. It was almost the same thing after 2, but we were off by a minus sign. So I'm just going to leave a little note in here. What I'm seeing is... It cycles after four derivatives. Okay, so if the fourth derivative looks like that, then that tells me that the eighth derivative would look the same. It would be two sine x. And then I can just start counting. So the 8th looks like this, 9th, 10th, 11th. The 11th is going to look like the 3rd. So the 11th derivative would actually be negative 2 cos x. Now, it wouldn't have been too bad to do 11 derivatives, but what if the question had said do 4,211 derivatives? That's when you definitely want to be thinking about, okay, little patterns of you know repeating after 4. Now this question did say, hey, when you're done and you have the 11th derivative, you're not really done. Can you please go and evaluate that once you're done, once you've found those derivatives, to uh, the value at pi over 3? Okay, sure. So negative 2 times the cosine of pi over 3. So at some point you do have to know your special angles. And so if you prefer to go and think back in degrees, which is the way I think about them, if I'm just doing my memorization deal here, that's the, the same as 60 degrees. Cosine of 60 degrees is one half. So we have negative two. You gotta do whatever you need to do in order to be ready to do all of those special angles. Okay, it's an expectation that you can do that. So it looks like the answer here is a negative one. All right. So that, uh, that takes care of those examples there and kind of takes care of our work with trigonometry. Um, we're just gonna now look at just practicing some old ideas just looking at tangent lines and just kind of seeing how we can look at questions and, and figure them all out uh, with, with the information that we know. Uh, number four, uh, what are the x and y intercepts of the tangent line to the curve 3x squared plus 2x minus 5? Um, and this tangent line is the one tangent line that's perpendicular to this other line, 1 quarter x plus 3. Whoa, I got a lot of stuff going on here. I'm getting a little confused. Usually they tell me the x value where we're playing the game. 
Um, but right now, well, all I know is that I'm, I'm going to be working with some other line here. So this is a line. And thinking about y equals mx plus b, that particular one has a slope that's actually equal to one quarter, okay, just based on some math 10. So there's some curve with a tangent line, and that tangent line has to have the same, uh, not the same slope, I was going to say the same slope, but it's perpendicular. So it's going to have to have an opposite reciprocal. So the slope for this tangent line, it must be not one quarter, but negative four. Okay, now I'm going to need a fair bit of room in order to get this question to work. So I'm going to start splitting my page here a little bit. I need to do the same, just give myself some more space. Um, all right, let's go and find the derivative of that function that they were giving us here. So y prime, that's going to be the slope of the tangent line. And I want to work with that parabola 3x squared plus 2x minus 5, and I want to find its derivative. And when I do the derivative for that, I get 6x plus 2. And I know that that must equal negative 4. Okay, you know what? Let me take 30 seconds out here and just kind of show you a picture of what's going on, just roughly speaking. There is a parabola out there somewhere. So it looks like this. You know, there's your 3x squared plus 2x minus 5. And we're trying to find some place where there's a tangent line that happens to have a slope that's negative 4. You know, maybe it looks like this because it's going to be perpendicular to some other line that may or may not even get near this parabola. So we've got a line they gave us that has a slope of one quarter and we're trying to find some tangent line that's going to have to have a slope of negative four that way they can meet at 90 degrees and we don't even know where that happens like hey what's this point right like what's your x and y value um it's gonna take us some time to do that and then when we're done they're like oh yeah well what are the x and y intercepts for that green line so then we're going to go and say okay well you know x and y intercepts and go from there so there's a fair bit of work to be done first thing to do is figure out like what is this x value right for where the tangent line touches that parabola that I've drawn there in blue all right let's go find out so that would be when 6x is equal to negative 6 uh, that happens when x is equal to negative 1 okay we're getting close I now know that this number right here let me erase that this number right here is actually a negative one. Okay, well, let's keep going. Let's go and find this y value. Okay, so that's my next maneuver. My computer will work with me. There we go. So yeah, let's go and find the y value. I'm gonna go back just to the original function for that. I'm gonna go back to y is three x squared plus 2x minus 5. You always have to go to the original function to find y values. And I want to find what y is when x is negative 1, sometimes pronounced y of negative 1, because it's a function. OK, well, that works out to be negative 4. So I now know this point that's out there. OK, this point that we've been kind of talking about is actually the point negative one, negative four. Okay, so we've got some more information. This is good. It's not so good as the way my computer's mistreating me here. There we go. Okay, so the point on that original parabola is negative one, negative four. Next thing, Let's go and find the equation of that tangent line. That's kind of what I'm wondering about next. What I know is there's a point on it. 
That tangent line shares the point with the curve of negative 1, negative 4, and it has to have a slope of negative 4. Okay, I'm going to play my usual game here. So y minus a negative 4, that's like y plus 4, sitting on top of x minus negative 1, that's like x plus 1, has to equal negative 4, right, has to be that slope. Slosh stuff around a little bit, y plus 4 is equal to negative 4 times x plus 1. And if I go one more step or two, I can tidy this right up. Looks like we're going to have a negative 4x, okay, this would be a minus 4 and then subtract a 4, okay, negative 8. There, there's the equation of the tangent line. So close. Thing is, they're actually saying, well, can you go and find the, um, the x and y intercepts for this? So at this point, we know this green line that I've drawn in here, this thing's got an equation of y is equal to negative 4x minus 8. But now I'm wondering, you know, if you actually go and look and see, hey, where does this hit the x and y axis? You know, what are those intercepts, right? That's, that's kind of our next task. So we'll just do them one at a time. The y-intercept, that's actually not a point, but just a number. It's a single number. It's the value for y when x is 0. A lot of people think it's the point, right? The point where it crosses, but it's actually just the y value where it crosses. So the y-intercept, all right, value for y when x is 0, that's easy, negative 4 times 0 minus 8. Looks like the y-intercept is equal to negative 8. We're close. We've got one of the two things they wanted halfway. Well, we're way past halfway, but it looks like we're only halfway. Next thing, the x-intercept. So the x-intercept, sometimes there's a couple for functions. This is the value for x, it's a single value, it's not a point, when y is equal to 0. Okay, so we'll just have to solve that. So looking back at my equation right here, I would say, okay, 0 is equal to negative 4x plus 8. Looks like the y, sorry, x intercept is going to be a... a negative 2. 2 or negative 2? Nope, negative 2. There we go. So it was kind of a long path there, right? Looking back at this original picture here, we first of all were told about some red line way out in the middle of who knows where, right? It's got a slope of a quarter. We were perpendicular to it, and then we had to really focus on finding this x value. Where is that tangent line actually occurring? So sometimes you gotta go on a bit of a bit of a journey in order to find out what you want. Okay, let's uh, keep going with our next example here. Number five, what is the y value of the point on the curve where the tangent line has the smallest possible slope? Oh, that's interesting, I've never seen a question like that before. Um, I do know that we could go and find the derivative, okay, so this thing called the derivative, that is the slope of the tangent line, okay, great, so the derivative for x cubed plus x, that would be 3x squared plus 1, okay, so I'm wondering, what is the smallest possible value that you could actually get out of 3x squared plus 1? That's the, the thing I'm wondering about. Well, that x squared, that will never be negative. It'll either be 0 or positive. So if you want to have 3x squared plus 1 be as tiny as you can, then just kind of looking at this part right there, the lowest value for that is 0. And then we would go and add 1. So if you're wondering, well, what is the smallest value of 
3x squared plus 1. It looks like the lowest value is going to be just a 0 plus a 1. It's going to be 1. And when does that happen, right? What's the x value where that occurs? So this happens when x is equal to 0. So I, I figured out when that derivative will be as tiny as it can be. It's going to be at 0. And they're saying, well, what's the y value of the point okay, where that tangent line is like that? I, I don't know. Let's go and check out y values. I know that y, it's a function of x, depends on x. It was given to me, right? They said it's x cubed plus x. Okay, that's great. Let's go and put in 0 because that's the moment where the derivative, this thing right there, is as small as it was ever going to get. All right, so we're going to put that in and see what the actual y value is. Oh, it looks like it's also a 0. So there's this, there's this point on the graph, and the point is actually 0 for x, 0 for y. They, they wanted the y value. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our, our desire is to just find out what the y value of that point is. Okay, so it's not the whole point. It's really just that 0 right there. Let's just take a look at this graph here just for a minute. I'll clear that out of there. Let's go and put in x cubed plus x. I'm going to try zoom 4. So yeah, okay, I can see that the tangent's pretty steep, and then not bad here. The, the tangent's got a slope of 1. It's never shallower than that. Then it just gets steep again. And so yeah, indeed, the, the tangent line has its smallest slope, a value of slope 1, right there, and it happens at that point, 0, 0. That's what's been going on with that particular question. Okay, let's move on to example 6. I'm going to do a little problem solving with this one. So see if you can find the values. For what values of a and b will this function, which looks like it's built in pieces, be differentiable at x is equal to 4? Well, I, I want this thing to be differentiable. So that phrase means it has to be smooth. But in order to be smooth, it has to at least be connected. Okay, So there's a couple of things we're looking for. We do want smoothness. That's what it means to be differentiable. But it's also going to have to be connected. So why don't we go and first look at this function just for y values to make sure that it's continuous. So we'll look here for that, for continuity. And then we'll go and look at the derivative, f prime, to make sure that this thing is actually differentiable, to make sure that it's actually smooth. I want total agreement as we move from the first branch up that goes up until 4 on to the second branch. Um, I might want to I might want to just rethink this particular expression here and say hey that's the same thing as x cubed minus 32 x to the negative 1. Why do the quotient rule if you don't have to, right? So doing derivatives, let's do the derivatives by piece. We'll just do them one at a time. So the derivative of x cubed minus 32 x to the negative 1, that's going to be 3x squared, negative 1 comes down, plus 32x to the negative 2. Then the derivative of this one, this, this trinomial here, it would be 4x plus, and then a linear term, that would be just plus a. Now this branch is going to be for when x is less than, and I'm hoping equal to 4. We'll get to that. Maybe we'll put that in in a minute if we can pull this off. And then this is when x's are greater than 4. And I really want this thing to work at the moment when we transition at x is equal to 4. So let's make sure that the y values touch, that they're connected, and then we'll make sure that it's smooth. So we'll start off with just connectivity, right? So we'll look for continuity. continuousness. Okay, let's make sure, we'll kind of think about this from the point of view of limits, right? As we take the limit as x approaches 4 from the low side and approaches 4 from the high side, wanting to make sure that they're actually going to touch each other. So putting 4 in, just evaluating our limit here, we're going to have, doing some direct substitution for that limit, 4 cubed minus 
32 divided by 4, that needs to match what's happening down here when we take the limit as x approaches 4 from the high side. Well, we'll just do direct substitution. So 2 times 4 squared plus a times 4 plus b. If we want those limits to match, then we need to have these values match up. So what do we have here? 64 minus 8 is equal to 32 plus 4a plus b. Okay, so there's a condition here. Just moving the numbers all to one side, we're going to have 24 is equal to 4a plus b. That has to be true in order to get those two graphs to touch each other. Like there's no way it could be differentiable unless it at least is continuous. So we've got to make sure they touch. That'll do that. Now let's make sure it's smooth. Now let's go and demand differentiability. Okay, so we're going to do a limit for this and this as you approach 4 from the low and from the high side. And hopefully we can get these to match as well. So doing some direct substitution now into these expressions that we've got, just to make sure that we've got some smoothness, some differentiability. Substituting into here, I'm going to have 3 times 4 squared plus 32 all over 4 squared. That has to match what's going on on the other side here. So 4, substituting the 4 in, direct substitution for this limit, plus a. Ooh, kind of nice. Don't have any b's. Uh, 4 squared is 16 times 3 is 48, plus 2 is equal to 16 plus a. So 50 is equal to 16 plus a. Okay, so 34 is equal to a. Yeah, that's nice. I don't have two unknowns there. I just know that 34 is equal to a. That's what it's going to take in order to get them to be smooth. Uh, but I have to make sure they touch as well, right? So let's go back and take that info now, and we'll just do some substitution. We'll drop that into here and see where that goes. That will demand that 24 is equal to 4 times 34 plus b. Okay, when I tried that out, I had a b value of negative 112. There, we've done it. We found what it'll take in order to have these two branches touch each other and be smooth when they do, right? We wouldn't want the branches to look like this, you know, where one comes in and then the other one leaves and they don't even they don't even connect right that's no good so we want connectability but beyond that we want differentiability we can't have them go and touch each other and then do that and have some sort of cusp some sort of corner on the graph so we wanted to make sure that not only did their y values match up but we wanted to make sure that their derivatives matched up as well we've done that it's worked so we could go back here and where i was kind of hesitant before I could go and say, yeah, for the derivatives, they are going to match. So we might as well put an equal sign on one of these, maybe this one. Now, to be fair, I, I, I kind of skipped a step in there. I was a bit sloppy mathematically. You know, any kind of purist mathematician would probably be cringing with what I was doing there for a little while. And I'm just going to insert what I should have done okay, in order to get this right. I really should have, I know I kind of used the words, but I should have actually written down a limit in order for this to be right. And the reason is, whoa, now we're going too far. There we go. The reason is, it's not fair for me to go and just put 4 into this branch because the, the function's definition says, no, 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 x has to be greater than 4. So I should have been super cautious and I should have said things like, oh, well, let's do a limit as x approaches 4 from the low side and then put in this 3x squared plus 30 nope which one was this I'm looking at the wrong one let's put the derivative in i need to be looking up here and say oh yeah x cubed minus 32 over x 
and hey, you need to be the same. And then for here, I should have at least for one line gone and said, oh yeah, X is approaching four, but from the high side on this expression, two X squared plus AX plus B. Then I can go and do this direct substitution and say, all right, we're off to the races. But it's not fair for me to just right away put four in when this thing is pretty clear right here and it says, no, 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 four is never allowed to go in, right? You have to be just past four. Uh, so kind of a, you know, a picky little point that math people would definitely be concerned about that we get that exactly right. Okay, moving on. Uh, a couple more examples, three more. Number seven, three or four more, ah, maybe four. Number seven, uh, surface area of a spherical balloon is given by that equation. Yep, four pi r squared. It varies with radius, of course. And part A says, determine the rate at which the surface area changes when r is equal to 18 centimeters. Um, we want to know how that that is affected by radius. Um, and approximately, how much does the area increase when the radius changes from 18 to 18.04? Okay, I should probably have added a little more in here. Determine the rate at which it changes with respect to radius, right? How does the radius affect it? Uh, let's just draw a little graph so I can be more clear, especially since the grammar of my question was not super good. So I've got this graph in my mind of the area of a balloon and its radius going this way. And it's 4 pi r squared, so it's a parabola. Right, it's going to look like this, and then just kind of explodes. And what I'm wondering is, what's that rate of change with respect to radius right at that moment when you happen to be at an 18? You know, what's going on with this blue graph here? It's obviously pitching steeper and steeper, but right at that moment, what's that tangent line doing? Okay, so that's that's what I want to look at for part A. Let's just go and do a derivative. So the derivative of the area with respect to radius, it's, that's the part I didn't put in here, right? The rate at which it changes with respect to radius. So the two would come down and we would say, oh, okay, eight pi times r. So that's the rate of change with respect to radius at any time, at any r value. And this question says, yeah, that's all very nice, but could you please find out like, what is that rate of change with respect to radius at the moment when your balloon happens to have a radius of 18. Oh, okay. Well, that would be 8 pi times 18. And that ends up being, well, a nice way to write that is 144 pi. That way you don't have any decimals showing up. Now, the units would be the units for area, which would be centimeters squared, divided by the run, which would be centimeters. So you have this, you know, centimeters squared per centimeter. And I guess that reduces, right, to just centimeters. But maybe it's kind of better to leave it as centimeters squared per centimeter. It kind of tells me what's going on. Um, now, for part B, it doesn't say to get this perfectly done. It says just approximate it, if you would. And so I'm going to use a little calculus here to do this approximation. And I'm going to look at it like this. We're not going far. We're only going from 18 to 18.04. So let's word this this way. You're on this graph, right? And when you run, think of rise and run. When you run from r equals 18 to r equals 18.04, when you go just that little bit down the road, when you do that, how much does the area graph rise? Now it says approximate it. it. Doesn't say to get it perfect. If you want to get it perfect, kids actually in grade nine can do that. They could sit there and go, well, hang on. Let me go and find out for you what the actual area is when you're at 18. So they would go, okay, four, pi times 18 squared and then they would say okay let me do it again for pi times 18.04 squared 
Oh, it's a little more. And then they would subtract, right? Okay, subtract the 4,071.504. I'm not even going to try to be this precise, right? Like, yeah, okay, it looks like it went up by, you know, by that much. Um, I'm going to try to do it in a, in a sneakier way. This, this calculation shows you exactly how much this blue curve graph goes up. But if you're only going to go to 18.04, you're not going very far down the road. Why not just follow that red tangent line? I know it's not going to be the perfect answer, but we're only trying to approximate it anyways. So why don't we do a small little run to 18.04, and then we can look at a small little rise that would happen. Might as well follow the red tangent line. It's going to be remarkably close anyways. So that's going to be my plan. I know that if slope of that tangent line is equal to rise divided by run, then if you only want to know what the rise is, it could actually just be the slope multiplied by the run. Okay, well, I've seen the slope right here. The slope of that graph at that point is 144 pi. That's my slope. And then my run, it's just the distance from 18 to 18.04. So it's decimal 04. Now the units, maybe I should have put those in. I'm going to do that. That 144 pi, that was centimeters squared of more area for every centimeter you walk forward. And then we're going to go forward. We're going to run by decimal 04 centimeters and what you can see are those centimeters are actually going to reduce gone gone and we will get an answer that's going to be an area answer okay which is great so i'm going to just try this out here i'm going to keep the whoop, keep the pi out of the story because it just kind of messes it up how about we go decimal zero four times 144 5.76 so my answer I like it better because it could be quick to do. I would say, oh yeah, that, that change in area, that extra little bit of area that you're going to get, it's 5.76 pi. That just saves me writing awful decimals. Um, centimeters squared. That's how much more area you're going to get. Now let's just check because this 18.1156, that's the official perfect number. I think if we multiply this by pi, we'll be very close to that. Yeah, you know, a couple sig figs. It, it's almost to the third sig fig. Yeah, third sig fig when you round, it's matching up as well. So it, it's pretty darn close. And we're going to play that game of being close enough in calculus quite a bit. Okay, next example. Where are we going? Uh, the amount of liters of gasoline in a leaking tank is given by this. Think of A for amount, right? Maybe that's why this has the A there. That's how much is left in the tank but apparently it's leaking. How fast is the uh, gasoline leaking out at the end of the third minute? And part B, what is the average leak rate during the third minute? Ooh, okay, so those are a little different, right? At the end of and during. Yeah, a little bit different there in terms of the time. Uh, I'm gonna graph this just because I'm curious to see what the amount looks like. Just no idea what it's gonna do. So 20 divided by, I'll use X for T. Okay, I have no idea where to zoom. We'll start here. I might need to go a little bigger. Yeah, we'll try a little larger for my Ys. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, the gasoline's definitely leaking out. Um, if I put zero in for time, 20 divided by... There's 20 at the beginning, and then it leaks out. Okay, so uh, I think this is probably worthy of a quick little sketch here just so that we can clarify when these times are going to be occurring. So we've got a mount and then we've got our time axis going this way. And we start off with 20 liters in the tank and then it goes, oh, dropped it pretty aggressively there. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so the times, where right, we got time one, time two, time three, time four, and so on. All right, first part, how much gasoline, 
how fast is the gasoline leaking out at the end of the third minute? That is a single time. That is right here, right? At t equals three, okay? That's the end of third minute. In part B, when we get there, it says during the whole third minute. Well, the first minute goes from zero to one, right? So it starts at zero, goes to one. That's the first minute. The second minute starts at one, goes to two. And then the third minute goes from two until three. So it does actually begin at time two, not at time three. So here is the entire third minute. Now we want to know how fast it's leaking, so we're looking for slope, right? They're definitely asking us to find the slope of this graph. And in part A, we want to do an instantaneous slope. We want to think about what is the slope of the tangent line right there. And then in part B, we're going to do an, an average rate of change between two spots, between you know here and here on the graph. But part A is definitely some calculus, so let's, uh, let's take care of that first. We can go and do a derivative. We can go and find dA dt. They gave us the a. Looks like it's a quotient rule. So derivative of the top is zero times the bottom, t plus one minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. Well, that would be just a one all over the bottom squared. Okay, well, we can tidy that up a little bit. That's going to be just negative 20, all sitting on top of t plus 1 squared. That's the slope of that graph. At any point, you might want to check. And now they're saying, well, can you please do it at the end of the third minute? So that's going to be at time 3. So sure, dA dt figured out at exactly time 3. Easy stuff. We'll just go and put 3 in. So that would be a negative 20 all on top of 3 plus 1 squared. So we've got a negative 20 sitting on top of 4 squared, sitting on top of a 16. That ends up being negative 1.25. Now the units, we've got liters up and down, and then they're talking about minutes going sideways. So the slope here would be liters per minute. Okay, that's exactly how fast it's pouring out right at that moment, at time three. But question B doesn't want to go and do any calculus. It's like, oh, can we just do this like grade 10? So B says, hey, can we just find the average slope? Now that third minute would be from t equals 2 to t equals 3. Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay, so that slope is going to be the amount at the second time minus the amount at the first time, all divided by the second time minus the first time. So in our story, we're going to be going amount at time three minus the amount at time two all over three minus two. Well, three minus two is pretty easy. That's just gonna be a one. Okay, hey, maybe we can do this without, uh, without a calculator. Let's see, at three, let's just go back and look at the function up here. Putting three in, um, three plus one is four, 20 divided by four is gonna be a five. Okay, that one wasn't too bad. So five minus, and then we'll see what's gonna go here, and it'll be sitting on a one. All right, let's go and put 2 in. Okay, 2 plus 1 is 3. 20 on top of 3. Eh, that's not so nice. 20 on top of 3. Well, you could make that better. You can get rid of that complex fraction just by multiplying the top and the bottom by 3. It won't look so ugly. So if we did that, we would have... Geez, this grade 10, no calculus one's taking more effort than the calculus one. What would you have here? 15 minus 20 all divided by 3. So we would have negative 5 thirds. 
Again, liters per minute would be the units. That's the average okay, over that time, that one minute long time. That takes us to the last page of the day. A couple of questions here. Uh, this first one is just kind of fun. Uh, it's just a little graphing exercise. Um, what does it say here? Another way to say that a function is differentiable. Remember, differentiable common language means smooth. So another way to say that it's smooth is to say that the function has local linearity at that point. In other words, if you zoom in close enough, the graph of the function will look like nothing more than a straight line, right? Linear line, same thing. Okay. Let's try these two graphs out and see how they go. I'm going to start off with just A. And they're saying, well, check it out at zero. All right, so clear that graph off. Let's put this one in. One plus, it's just a fun little exercise. The square root of x squared plus decimal zero, zero, 001. I have no idea what zoom to use, so I'm going to use just zoom 4 and just see how that looks. And they're saying, what about right at x equals 0? What do you think? Ooh, oh, that doesn't look healthy. That doesn't look smooth, right? It looks like it's got quite a cusp to it, kind of like an absolute value graph. So, you know, I'd, I'd sit here and go, oh, yeah, that one's definitely not locally linear, right? That's going to be a no, right? But be patient. Check this thing out a little bit more, right? It says if you zoom in, it might look straight. Well, let's let's zoom in. So I'm going to go zoom in. And right now you can see your, your little pixels blinking there right at the origin. I actually want to zoom in at this spot. So I'm going to move that up a little bit. And let's say that zoom in here, just kind of centering it. Okay, it still does not look locally linear, but let's keep moving in. So I just keep hitting enter. Whoa, whoa hang on. Things are changing going closer going closer okay hang on I thought that was a total sharp corner but it's looking it's looking more rounded this thing might actually be differentiable it might be locally linear now this time when I go zoom in I'm gonna just move my pixel up to right where that y-intercepts happening okay all right now if it's truly differentiable and it's truly locally linear, I should be able to just keep zooming in, right? Just wearing the battery so on my calculator, keep zooming in, and eventually it should look like a straight line. That's the whole idea of differentiable, right? Is it going to look straight, at least to within the horrible big pixels that we've got on the T83 here? That almost looks like a straight line. One more. Oh, not quite. I may have to recenter, zoom in. I'll just go up a little bit are we there yet there it is so I'm gonna change my answer at first I thought that that was not differentiable but you got to be so careful right? you got to zoom in a lot let's try this again with the one beside it oh this one looks pretty intense here what is going on a cube root of x squared Ooh, okay well under the math menu here I think there's cube roots yeah there it is cube root of x squared Close that up. There are the roots done. Divided by 5 plus this crazy thing here, x plus 1 cubed. And zoom 4. Is this one locally linear? Oh, yeah, it looks pretty smooth there, right? You know, so I would probably say yeah. But wait a minute, I got burned before. We should zoom in. Zoom in. And I don't want to zoom in right off the origin. I'm just going to bring this up to where it looks like the intercept is. Okay, so yeah, I think this one's going to be fine, right? Let's just zoom in a little bit more. Keep hitting enter here. You know, it should look like a straight line once we zoom in enough. That's yeah, looking like it will be, right? So maybe they both were, uh, who knows, maybe is every function locally linear, right? Just keep zooming in, right? Let's try this again. See if this looks nice and differentiable. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe not. Right? So you keep zooming in. No, that definitely looks like two different straight like two straight lines that both have different slopes. And if you keep zooming in, you're gonna find that each of those sections looks beautifully straight and they do not share the same slope. So I gotta change my answer on this one. 
so you really do have to zoom in close enough, right, to be sure. And then you can see whether it is differentiable or not. That was just a fun little exercise. Um, and the last one, a little problem solving here again. Can you find a quadratic function? Okay, so that means a parabola, right? Something that looks like this. Can you find an ax squared plus bx plus c such that all these things are true? If you put one in for x, you have to get 40. Two into the derivative, you've got to get 16. And 16 into the second derivative, you've got to get 12. Okay, well, let's go and try this out. Um, first of all, let's go and put one in. Right? So if I do f of 1, that would be a times 1 squared plus b times 1 plus c has to equal 40. Okay, well, I can tidy that up a little bit and say a plus b plus c has to equal 40. That, that is underdetermined. That has um, you know, a whole bunch of unknowns to it, three unknowns, one little statement there. So that's, um, that's going to need some more work, right? I can't tell you what the value for a and the value for b and the value for c is from that. Maybe, maybe if we do a derivative, we can learn something from that. So let's try this out. Let's do a derivative. f prime of that quadratic function would be 2ax, the 2 would come down, plus b for that linear term, and then no c, the c, the constant term, would go away. Okay, well, let's check out what's happening here with this. Apparently, if I put 2 in, they're telling me I really should get 16. Well, let's see what happens. I would have 2 times a times 2 for x plus b needs to be 16. Uh, what is that saying? 4a plus b has to be 16. Hmm. Also underdetermined. Like, what, what's the deal with that? I can't really tell you what a or b is. It's got too many unknowns. All right, well, let's... Let's go again. Let's do another derivative and see what happens. So the third derivative, sorry, second derivative of that quadratic function would be 2a, because that was a linear term, and then 0. Whoa, there are, there are no x's. Um, it's not going to be a problem, but it's just kind of interesting, right? It's like, whoa, there are no x's anymore. OK, and they're saying, well, when you go and check out that second derivative, when you put 16 in for x, you need to have 12 come out. Well, this 16, it, it is an x value. Now, what I'm noticing is look, there are no x's. I don't even care what your x value is. It's just 2 times a. So don't get spooked by that. It actually makes things pretty easy. This just says, oh, okay, well, there, there's your second derivative. And you're saying you want it to be 12, right? That's what they said up here. Oh, geez, it looks like a has to be 6. That is not underdetermined. That, that's telling me an answer. I now have one of the three answers. A has to be 6. And then I can start going and, and substituting back in. Let's go back to the stuff I have there in blue. You can say, all right, I have just learned that A is for sure going to be 6. So 4 times 6 plus B has to be 16. 24 plus B has to be 16. Looks like B has to be a negative 8. Okay, we're getting closer. And then one more move should do it. Let's go and substitute back into the original function. So we could say, okay, A plus B plus C apparently had to be 40. I can still see it at the top of the screen there. Learn that A is 6. B is negative 8. I don't really know what C is. 40. Okay, well that says that C needs to be 42. Oh, geez, that's got to be right. Okay, so we found the three numbers. Now, actually, the example doesn't say find the three numbers. It says find the quadratic function. So I guess we haven't officially got things done yet until we say, hey, here's your quadratic function. F of X is going to be 6 x squared minus 8x plus 42. There, that'll abide by all of the rules that they had there. That'll actually work nicely. And that is the end of our, uh, of our lesson here for trigonometry and just reviewing some stuff with tangents.